Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here this evening for our webinar, um, which is Black History as African Liberation. My name is Cherise Burdenstelli, or Dr. CBS, and I'm the co-coordinator co of the Black Alliance for Peace Research and Political Education team. This webinar is actually the first in a series of six webinars, which is our Black, uh, our Black Power webinar series. And so we are so excited to have you here this evening for a wonderful conversation. And uh, without further ado, I want to offer the bio of our host this evening, Two Black. So Two Black is a poet, traveling and teaching artist, and author fusing historical content, current events, creative practice, and interpersonal interactions on international stages. He is currently the host of the Black Myths podcast, a, po a podcast uh, debunking the bullshit <laughs> set about Black people, while also the producer for The Last of Intellectual, an unapolog <laughs> unapologetically radical Black web show hosted by myself and Dr. Layla Brown. Two Black's words have been published in online publications such as Black Agenda Report, Left Voice, Blavity, and Hood Communist. He is also a member of this illustrious alliance, Black Alliance for Peace, which is an anti-war, anti-imperialist, and pro-peace grassroots organization. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Two Black. Hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, I will be your host today. Um, so we got a lot of uh, content to get into. I'm just going to give a quick overview of uh, Black history, and then I'm going to let my hood communist comrades really just go in on um, some of the pitfalls of uh, Black history. If I could get my presentation on the screen, uh, we can go over that real briefly. All right. Um... Actually, I'm gonna, don't have that, Hold somebody. Sorry. Which one? If not, I can just do it, I can just talk. If we, I don't wanna drag this out. Um, See, so I'm gonna just talk, if it comes up, it comes up, but this isn't, this isn't hard. Um, all right, so um, Black History Month, does not start as a month. I'm sure most of us already know this. Um, what we want to do here is give it a little bit more um, depth than it's given in the kind of mainstream narrative. Uh, so, I mean, most people I'm sure have heard that um, historian Carter G. Woodson um, was was um, given um, the name as the founder of, um, of what we call Negro History Week. Uh, but we need to go back a little a little bit further because um, this this is just to start kind of debunking these narratives. So Carter G. Woodson didn't do this by himself. Um, in 1915, um, after the uh, the Jubilee, uh, the National Half Century Exposition in Lincoln Jubilee, um, he forms an organization um, with a number of scholars called the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. Um, that now is called the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. Um, and they, they tend to establish a common theme um, a, around African American history, as, as they call it. Um, I want to give I want to name out some of those people because again we want to get rid of this like great man in history narrative. So William B. Hartgrove, um, George Cleveland Hall, Alexander L. Jackson, and James E. Stamps. Um, these were these were some of the co-founders of that organization. Um, so as we always talk about in Black Alliance for Peace, you know it takes the masses of Black people and it takes organizations. So this wasn't just a day or a month or a week founded by one man. This was an organization. This is also founded at the time um, that. The second wave of the Klan is is on the rise. Um, the birth of a nation, for those who don't know, you know, White Supremacist film was also considered a groundbreaking film that is depicting black people being lynched and some of the worst stereotypes of black people at the time. Um, that was that film is raging at this time that this organization is is forming. So representation in this sense, um, as far as establishing history for for uh, for African and Black people to have as something to combat white supremacy is an important um, is an important aspect of this um, representation. Later, as we'll talk about, um, becomes something different. Um, so uh, initially, they um, they establish initially they establish um, you know certain Negro as they call it at the time Negro history clubs and stuff like that. And eventually, by uh, February seventh, nineteen twenty six, um, Negro History Week um, begins. And they chose that in the second week of February to um, commemorate um, 
Frederick Douglass and um, uh, President Abraham Lincoln's birthday. Um, not necessarily because Carter G. Woodson was a big fan of um, Abraham Lincoln, but because this was something at the time that, that black folks were, were um, heavily into and he wanted to tap into the culture. And if you want to reach your people, you got to um, tap into the culture. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that starts. And then from there, they start establishing, um, they start, they, that, that organization and Carter G. Woodson starts establishing connections with schools and churches and local organizations uh, to teach black history. Um, so black history week, um, I think is a misnomer sometimes, um, is not solely something where we just say, okay, this is a one week of the year that we're going to start reading history. Carter G. Woodson intended for it to be a, a moment where we, um, were examining the history we were already teaching, um, our, our, our students, our children and our people. So it was not something that you just cherry picked out of the year. Um, even when it was a week, let alone when it becomes a month. Uh, so just want to note that, uh, um, Daryl, Daryl, uh, historian Daryl Scott actually says, um, as as time went on, by the 1930s, Woodson complained about the intellectual charlatans, black and white, popping up everywhere, seeking to take advantage of the public interest in black history. He warned teachers not to invite speakers who had less knowledge than the students themselves. So it's often turned into this way where people can just cash in on it on a check. You know, there's a whole lecture circuit around it. I'm not completely knocking that, um, but it was supposed to be something where folks were actually informing themselves to, to have a sense of dignity and also to combat some really vicious um, images of, of um, that, that white supremacy was putting out at the time. Um, you know, and so, so history was to give black people a sense of pride, a sense of understanding where they come from, and so on and so forth. Um, so from 1926 to about 1970, it was uh, something that was just celebrated pretty much within the African community in America. It wasn't something that was officially recognized um, throughout the country. There was no, there wasn't corporate sponsorships at this point. You know, we're still talking about Jim Crow for most of the time. Uh, by the time we get to um, 1970, um, Kent State um, was the first, to my knowledge, uh, celebrated called Black History Month in 1970, the um, Black United Students. Um, so, um, named it Black Black History Month at the time instead of Negro History Week or even Negro History Month. Uh, by 1976, um, Gerald Ford, um, oh, there it is. <laughs> by 1976, Gerald Ford uh, recognized Black History Month in 1976. Uh, it's important to know that he was. Remember, this is a this is a Nixon era, so Nixon had gotten kicked out. This dude wasn't doing very well. He was trying to find a way to save his political capital. And this was a weak attempt to do it. It didn't really work, um, but this was the goal. So he establishes it nationally. And this is right where it starts to pick up as as some of the stuff that we're going to be criticizing or just talking about at length. Um, it starts to become more corporatized. Not to say that it was perfect even before this either, because there are critiques to be made even even in the era pr previously. Um, you can click on the next, the next point on there. Um, but it becomes recognized not just not just in America, but in Canada, United States, or excuse me, United Kingdom, um, Ireland, um, at different points in time. Um, so it becomes recognized internationally, and and people try to, particularly in the the, the quote unquote developed you know European world, it becomes recognized internationally, and um, and different people take it up how they want to do it. Um, but unfortunately, as time goes on, it doesn't. It's, it starts to focus on a, a really narrow view of so-called black history. So you can hit the next slide. <clears throat> uh, click again, please. Um, so what we start to see even more is the emphasis of, of s emphasize the celebration of so-called African-American accomplishments. So this is where you get things like the first black person to eat French fries or the first black person to walk outside or whatever they talk about like you just get these random you know takes about black people and we're supposed to be proud because no black person's ever walked outside before but now somebody did it in a white neighborhood so you know we should be we should feel accomplished like this is where you start getting these kind of narratives they really start peaking up um but even i would say even previous to that you have this contribution they're, they're trying to focus on black contributions to america which kind of helps re it kind of helps further colonize people into this mindset that we're trying to like, look what you did for America, right? Like that, that's how it tends to go. Um, next point. 
Um, yeah, I said first blacks. Uh, so, and you, as you see on the side here, um, proudly supporting historically black colleges, universities sponsored by McDonald's. Um, so this is what I'm saying as far as like, there's this overemphasis on um, the state, whether it's the corporate side of the government coming in and trying to co-opt um, this message. Um, so what today we want to do is talk about, um, today we want to be able to talk about like, not only just how it's been co-opted, but maybe a more radical understanding of how we can, how we can view our history because maybe we don't need to focus on celebrations in that sense, or maybe if we are celebrating, maybe there are different things we need to celebrate and maybe we need to have a more critical analysis of history. Um, so Hood Communists had written this piece um, and that's what we're here today to talk about. Um, this piece called uh, Why We Say Fuck Black History Month um, and, and trying to move towards, you know, African Liberation Month as, as we're t discussing today and understand this in a more, in a more critical way. Um, so that's just a quick bit of like how how um, Black History Month came to be. Um, there's much more. Like I barely scratched the surface, so I would encourage y'all to, to um, those who are listening to look into it further. Um, so I'm going to read the bios of our panelists today, and then we're going to um, jump off with their presentations. Um, so again, we have the editors of Hood Communist with us, who collectively wrote this piece. Um, so we have. Ajamo Umi is an organizer for um, All African People's Revolutionary Party and the author of five books. Um, we have Erica Keynes uh, is a coordinating committee, uh, coordinating committee uh, is on the coordinating committee of Black Lions for Peace and a member of Black, the Black Working Class Centered Ojama People's um, Progress Party in Maryland. Keynes is the founder of Liberation Through Reading and also the co-editor of the revolutionary African blog Hood Communist. Uh, Salifu Mack is a Pan-African and Socialist and member of the All-African People's Revolutionary Party, the Black Alliance for Peace, the Low Country, the Low Country Action Committee. He is also a member of the Media Committee of the National Network on Cuba and a co-editor of the African Nationalist blog, Hood Communist. And then Onya Sanyu Chitoya is a cadre with the All-African People's Revolutionary Party and the All-Africans Women Revolutionary Union, an editor with Hood Communist, and a member of the National Coordinating Committee of the Verisimamos uh, Brigade. So we're going to start. Um, first, we're going to just welcome them, thank them for being here. Um, and then we're going to start with uh, Ajamu. He is going to give his presentation. He has 10 minutes. Before we get to that, I do want to say one quick thing. If you have questions, please put them in the um, Q&A section. Do not put them in the chat. We will not pay attention to them. They will not be relevant. And if you do want to put something in the Q&A, please put a question in the Q&A. Do not put a, an essay or a dissertation. I'm sure you have great things to say, but we only have limited time. So thank you. All right, Ajamu. Thank you all. Thank you very much. We definitely want to give much praise and thanks to the Black Alliance for Peace for having this event, but also just for the day-to-day -day work that you do. We know how difficult it is and we love and appreciate you. So I don't know if it's possible to get my presentation up. Yay, looks like it's going. Okay, so just briefly as Two Black, I think beautifully laid out, um, the purpose for us writing the piece that we did last year that we have rerun this year and done that collectively is because we wanna make the point that Everybody has institutions. The capitalist system has institutions. Their institutions are things like the 4th of July or what they call the 4th of July or Thanksgiving or what they call Thanksgiving or Veterans Day where they expect us to celebrate a mercenary US military that murders and ravages the entire planet. And all of these things that are really just designed to normalize values of support for international capitalism and imperialism. So oppressed people, if we're ever gonna be free, we have to create our own institutions that are designed to directly confront the backwardness of their uh, institutions that are designed to keep us oppressed and in a oppressed slave mentality. So when we, we have to understand clearly that so-called African History Month, Black History Month, Negro History Week, that's an institution. The question is who controls the institution? Do we control it or do our enemies control it? So I think a big part of our piece was to raise that question and that's what we wanna do. So we split it into sections and the section I wrote is about how Africa and other parts of the African diaspora, meaning in other words, Africans who don't live in the United Snakes of America, how that's completely excluded 
from this so-called Black History Month annual commemoration. So if I could just go to my next slide, first point, please. Next slide, first point, please. Thank you. And the first point, please. Thank you. And so, you know, we're talking about this effort and you see it all, it's rampant for all the PhDs um, from YouTube. They got PhDs from YouTube. You see it all the time. This concept going around that, well, we're not the same people. We're not the same as Africans in Mexico or Belize or Dominican Republic or Brazil or Nigeria or France. And you hear this all the time, but there are several reasons why this is just an absurd analysis. The first one is that if you look at our history and you, you see it clearly, that when they kidnapped us and forced us to come to the Western Hemisphere, they didn't do that in a way that was designed to protect our integrity. So they didn't have air-conditioned shuttles lined up on the shores of Africa. Like, are you Ibu? Are you Yoruba? Are you Fulani? You all stay together. We want to make sure you all stay together. No, they just ripped us apart and took us over here. So Africans in Belize, in Brazil, in Honduras and Puerto Rico and Brazil, a lot of these people are your biological relatives. So that alone makes it absurd for us to accept the colonial definition of who we are. And that's different for us than anyone else. And we have to understand that. And it just doesn't benefit us in any way. The only people and forces that benefit from us thinking that way are the forces that are oppressing us. Next point, please. And then the second part is that we, we have to always remember that the strategy of capitalism is to always, 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 always create loyalty for Africans in the U.S. to this backward capitalist system. So you hear it all the time with African people. Well, all I know is America. So that's what I focus on. Well, that's by design, by our enemies. So we have to begin to promote this concept that it's not in our interest to just see the United Snakes of America. In no way does that benefit us as a people. What benefits us is seeing our people all over the world because our problem didn't just start in this backward uh, sewer pit that we call the United Snakes of America. It started before there was a United States of America. So it can only be resolved by looking at the entire world. So we have to begin to perpetuate that. Next slide, please. Or next point, please. I'm sorry. So capitalism, as we all know, was built and is maintained on exploiting Africa and exploiting Africans and a whole lot, exploiting a whole lot of other people. So since we know that, logic dictates that our strength comes from our unification. The only way we're ever going to bring down this backward system is we have to be unified. So when our people in the the Colton mines in the Congo decide we're going to rise up and we're not going to pick this for Apple and Samsung. Apple, Samsung, Motorola, those are U.S. based, largely corporations. We work for them here. We live by them. We ride the bus by them, whatever we do. So when that begins to happen, we play a critical role in shutting those places down so that they're unable to function so that we can begin to empower ourselves to see that we have the power and we can create the reality where we free ourselves, free our Colton, so that we can use it as it should be used to solve the problems that we have as a people and not to go into the pocketbooks of Apple and Motorola and all of those thugs, crooks and criminals. So with that, I, I say again that our situation is international. And again, Black History Month as it's presently practiced is designed to make us good American slaves and to only look at the slave master and the crumbs he gives us and the United Snakes of America. And as long as we don't expand beyond that backward analysis, we family, friends, and any police on here will forever be stuck in the situation that we're in today. Thank you. All right, thank you for that. That was very quick and to the point and nailed it. Um, all right, so um, next up is, um, is Next up is um, Erica Keynes. Um, she has 10 minutes. Next, Erica Keynes. Peace, Africans. <laughs> um, I'm just waiting on my image.
Are we ready? All right. <clears throat> so um, for those who have read the piece, uh, you know, we have a part in it that talks about the erasure of non cis male African revolutionaries. Um, if you have not seen this image before, this image uh, came out on the cover of The New Yorker when Kamala Harris uh, won um, VP. So uh, the significance of this image for me is that it was uh, created by Kadir Nielsen. And for those who are not familiar with Kadir Nielsen, um, Kadir Nielsen has done a plethora of children's book covers. And for those who may not be familiar with me, I uh, have a program called Liberation Through Reading, uh, which has been a successful program where it's a, a gift back program where I provide um, children's books uh, that represent black children. And one of the books that I provide is Kadir Nielsen's, um, this book right here. I don't know if everyone can see it. Heart and Soul, the story of the African, uh, excuse me, of America and the African Americans, right? And it's a pretty really good basic foundational book of black history that I give all the time. So then when I seen this, and he's also a Coretta Scott King award-winning um, illustrator. He has done so many covers on Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, um, the Afro-American League, et cetera, et cetera. So when I seen this and the imagery of it, it made me pause about not only my work, but the intention of this image. So like I said, I was asked to discuss the erasure of African revolutionary non-men during Black History Month. So I'll start with this. Um, in the autobiography of Asada Shakur, Asada notes that the usual way that people are taught to think in America is that each subject is in a little compartment and has no relation to any other subject. For the most part, we receive fragments of unrelated knowledge and our education follows no logical format or pattern. It is exactly this kind of education that produces people who don't have the ability to think for themselves and who are easily manipulated. So as with all things, <clears throat> Black girl magic, listen to black women, censor femmes, et cetera, et cetera, which in hindsight are radically liberal sentiments have derived from a genuine need and want, wanting to be seen and wanting to be heard. However, in the context of Black History Month, those sentiments were nothing more than a contribute excuse me, a contribution to the continuation of the erasure of the radical politics of non-men. The political need to be represented has been weaponized and as such identity politics get stripped away and reduced to identity reductionism. How? Well, we can look at how there's been a shift from non-men being completely removed from the conversations about the civil rights era to highlight individual men like Martin Luther King, making the women in their lives docile supporters, to acknowledging that non-men being present but stopping just shy of their ideologies and their politics. So the fight then became about inclusion into a narrative that we don't control. Just as Woodson knew, intellectual charlatans would take advantage of the public interest in black history. So now we are sure to talk about Fannie Lou Hammer, but not Sucker to Ray sending for SNCC to come to Guinea and how that experience framed their views on self-determination beyond a vote. <laughs> and now we can comfortably uplift Marsha P. Johnson, but none of her organizing work or the plethora of organizations she founded in her lifetime, including STAR, and uplifting Bayard Rustin in spite of his affinity towards Zionism, and maybe mentioning Balagoon in passing because of an identity, but never the ideology and the politics. A former top cop can have positively be compared to Shirley Chisholm, but no mention of Black communist women, Charlie Mitchell and Charlotte Bass being the actual first Black women to run for president and vice president. The focus of identity skews any focus on the ideology as if this holds no significance. Political differences are stripped from the discourse. So we talk about so many non-men now as first this and first that, but what we are continuously directed away from are their politics and their commitment to the people. And this is called progress. This is a win. 
So Harriet Tubman on the dollar, Maya Angelou on the quarter is a win. A black woman Supreme Court judge is a win. These things, of course, are our ancestors' wildest dreams as told to us by corporations stripped in red, black, and gold. Excuse me, red, black, and green. But if we acknowledge more than a representation of, but the beliefs attributed to our ancestors like Ella Baker, Amy Ashford Garvey, Winnie Mandela, et cetera, that we would understand the need to not just acknowledge the intersections of who they were, but understanding what they stood for and who they stood for. These are the critical questions we need to ask as we move forward with clarity on how we got into the position of exalting non-men who take up the space as tools for empire, as symbols to honor, value, and strive to be while the history of revolutionary non-men is folded into the American project and a sole identity of patriotism. Without any critical examination of how we are taught about any of our radical figures in a nation where colonized communities have had to fight to have a say in a curriculum, community control of education, and what, we, what our children learn, we will inevitably be subjected to the normalization of identity reductionism, the normalization of first Blacks, and ultimately the normalization of intersectional imperialism. Representation without a concrete revolutionary politic is just another form of counterinsurgency and a far away from African liberation. So to close, I'd like to leave you all with a quote from Claudia Jones in the end of neglect to a problem to Negro women. The bourgeoisie is fearful of the militancy of the Negro woman and for good reason. The capitalists know far better than any progressives seem to know that once Negro women undertake action, the militancy of the whole Negro people and this of the anti-imperialist coalition is greatly enhanced. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, again, as y'all can hear, like I think someone said in the chat, this ain't for the faint hearted, so, you know. All right. Um, next up, we got a uh, uh, Salifu Mac. All right, ten minutes. And real quick, um, if y'all have any questions, remember put them in the Q and A. I don't see anything in there as of yet, but go ahead and put your questions in the Q and A. All right, Salifu. Hello. Can you hear me? Can I? Am I here? Can I be seen? Can I be heard? I think so. All right, cool. I'm gonna go with it. All right, so um, assalamu alaikum to everybody, free Mumia, free all political political prisoners. I'm very excited to be here talking about this today. I got a lot to say, and I got ten minutes to say it. So let me just go. I'm not gonna waste a lot of time on this slide. I just want to make a point because I know y'all seen this girl going viral. She don't wear my nerves down so bad over the past few weeks. But something that I've been thinking about a lot lately is how we get from this image on the left which is Claudia Jones. Um, and we all understand the history of Claudia Jones and the, the way that the state uh, pursued her relentlessly, right, for her, for her anti-imperialist communist politics to this point where we're all seeking to be influencers, lifting up ourselves and our images, spouting State Department popped up talking points. Um, and I wanna make the point here that a lot of this has to do with the erasure of African organization. It's something that's big as a part of Black History Month um, we've seen the lifting up of sort of like the one great man and then no follow up about the organizations that these people come out of. So let me get the next slide. All right. So again, I want to make this point that we have we've had African organizations erased. So what we see now culturally should not surprise us. The first thing is a culture of vanity. A very individual centered analysis everything is about how I feel my lived experience what I saw what I observed how can I be lifted up how can I be platformed another thing is this like intense focus on anti-authoritarian politics and most people don't even know what that means and so it's like y'all cousins be online talking about how they hate organizations and why people don't need to be in organizations and all that kind of kind of foolishness um and then the other thing is that we are we have this like intense fear of growing and changing and being hesitant to reevaluate our tactics because again these are these are all three things that come from being a part of organization if you've ever been in an organization then you understand how important all of these things are let me get the next slide so i just wanted to put these beautiful africans on the screen i wanted y'all to see 
African people in, in community with each other, in organization with each other. Um, let me get the next one. Look at them. Uh, so um, one of the things that I wanna do tonight is lift up an organization that is very important to me because, they, because of the growth that they demonstrate over time and how they eventually reach a particular politic that I believe right now we are seriously lacking and really in need of. Let me get the next one. Look at them. Like, look at them, y'all. So if you if you don't understand by now, the, the people, the images that y'all are seeing, these are members of SNCC, um, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, and like I said, I'm really going to lift them up tonight uh, and really I really want to talk about their evolution as an organization. So let me get the next slide. <clears throat> what I'm going to what uh, and, and the next one, just look at them, y'all. That's it. Just look at them. All right. So go back. There's like one before that. OK, so go back. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> go back. All right. So when we talk about the importance of organization, y'all. SNCC as an organization was a was an organization where people lived together, ate together, studied together, pissed each other off. People was driving hundreds of miles around the country in raggedy cars. This whole idea that a person is a person because of other people is really demonstrated inside of the history of African organizations inside the U.S. and outside, right? You don't get an MLK, you don't get a Kwame Ture, you don't get a Fannie Lou Hamer, you don't get any of these things without organization. So let me get to the next point. Organization is also how young African people in the U.S. become the face of the anti-war movement. There is no anti-imperialism in the U.S. There is no true anti-war movement, no true anti-imperialism without young African people, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20-year-old Africans standing up against war. So let me get the next slide. Um, so I, so I, this is a this is the thing I put together because I want to talk quickly about the evolution of SNCC. So in 1960, the organization forms and they have this uh, this tactic. They're they're going with this tactic of nonviolence, right? 61 to 63 is is a time where they are exercising for exercising their right for voting rights and they're going about on the freedom rides. 64 is a huge turning point in the organization because that is Freedom Summer and this trip to Guinea. So a little bit about freedom, a little bit about Freedom Summer. During 1964, the Freedom Summer is the summer of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. When Africans in Mississippi decided to challenge the mainstream Democratic Party by forming their own, their own uh, independent party, right? And in forming that party, in going to the DNC, this is a point in time where members of SNCC, young members of SNCC, like, uh, like, like once Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Ture, um, even Imam Jamil Alamine, uh, formerly known as H. Rap Brown, they start to see that this political system is bullshit, right? And then there's also that trip to Guinea um, in which uh, Onye talked recently about Fannie Lou Hamer and others being a part of and going, leaving the States for the first time and seeing Africa. And this summer is a summer of like analysis shifting for the organization. So 66 is when SNCC starts to lean heavily into its black power position. And they also start to develop an anti-war stance. So you hear, hell no, we won't go everywhere. It's on t-shirts, it's in movies and all these things. That came out of the mouth of Africans in the US first and foremost before, it was, before it's been co-opted and used everywhere else. 67 to 70, SNCC starts to develop an anti-colonial, anti-capitalist position, right? And I'm going to show y'all in the next few slides, SNCC takes a hard line position on Vietnam War. They also take a hard line position on Palestine. Let me get the next slide. So this is, this is a letter that they went around um, posting uh, and it basically is telling Negroes why they should not be a part of fighting for any war for America. This is something that we are incredibly confused about right now, by the way. Let me get the next slide. All right, this image is very important to me. So Ethel Miner, as a member of SNCC, they have this ideological struggle within the organization and they come to align on Palestine because of Ethel Miner's contribution to the organization. So this is an example of an image that went out in the paper in 65, I think. 
Um, and it's like, it's basically explaining Zionism. It's basically, it's anti-Zionist, it's pro-Palestinian um, sovereignty. And this, they're, they're, like a, they're like an early organization in the US. These are young Africans that are not confused about anti-imperialism, right? Okay, next slide. So, sorry, that was 67, because that was July, and I think that was like June, this is August. And by, by, by August, SNCC is being attacked heavily in the press, right? So this says, um, this is Negro extremist group continues anti-Jewish attack condemned by other Negroes. They're being taken out left and right by all these people who had claimed to have been in support of, you know, voting rights and da-da-da, the white liberal, the white moderate, they're all coming out and attacking SNCC. Let me get the next slide. And this is what Kwame Ture uh, says about how a big part of how SNCC comes to an end. While we did this, opposed the Vietnam War, Zionists everywhere supported SNCC. We spoke, we spoke against the Vietnam War, we spoke against the draft, they supported us. But once we spoke against Israel, SNCC was destroyed in three months. All right, let me get the next one. So this is this is the last one. This is this is just a general point that I that I wanted to make. SNCC does not make that evolution from being an organization centered on thinking about the plight of African people in the US to becoming an organization that is thinking about railing against capitalism and thinking about fighting back against imperialism as a bunch of individuals running around talking about, you know, I, I just got to do me, I'm an individual. This is ideological struggle happening with inside the context of an organization. So what we are offering as an alternative with African, African Liber, Liberation Month is saying, you cannot separate the lineage of African liberation struggle. It's not what happened in the 60s and then the 90s and then BLM. This is all one thing. The next thing is that we have to recenter shared struggle. And then the third thing is that we are not in the museum, keep building. The African liberation fight did not stop in the 60s. It did not stop in the 70s. It's continuing. We are not like dead or like resting in a museum. This is every day. So thank y'all. Uh, thank you, man. That was that was uh that was dope. Like that was a that was a master class education. I'm gonna go back and watch that myself. That was great. All right. Um uh, last, uh, given the last presentation, and we're going to get into um, a more interactive conversation with questions, um, is is uh, on your son, you. Uh, so, yeah, we got uh, 10 minutes, so we're doing good on time. So, you got it. Thank you. Let me dismiss this. I do not have slides. I do have notes, though. Um, so, the art portion of the article that I worked on was a section talking about the promotion of neocolonial propaganda in Black History Month in particular, but in general uh, within Western capitalist societies. And what I mean by neocolonial propaganda is specifically a narrative pushed about Africa where we have this image in Western propaganda of Africa being dependent on the West. I am sure all of us that grew up in the snakes saw those commercials about feeding a starving child in Africa for 10 cents a day and blah, blah, blah. Um, this idea that Africa is just a mess that uh, Western imperialist powers need to come in and fix, that it's a charity case. The reality, as has already been stated multiple times, is in fact the West is exploiting Africa. Africa is propping up the West. Africa in reality is trapped in a parasitic relationship with nations like the United Snakes, uh, uh, with Europe, with Israel, with Australia, they are looting Africa's resources, they are looting Africa's labor, they are looting Africa's land, and they are doing so to build the wealth of these capitalist imperialist nations. So Africa is not a charity case. The West is actually a charity case. The West is why those children are starving, why they are working in mines at eight, nine years old, why they are brutalized by police and militaries all over the continent, and in fact, the world. So that's the first neocolonial myth that is boosted about Africa. But the other uh, uh, major uh, component of the propaganda that we hear about Africa when it's mentioned at all uh, in these, these Black History Month celebrations uh, is this, this like boosting of the richness of African history and culture, which tends to focus on a specific materialistic narrative, an apolitical spirituality and royal status in particular. I'm talking about media like Beyonce's Black is King, for example, that came out last year, this full fantasy complete with thousand dollar fashions about a, 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 a hypothetical African monarchy. I'm talking about media like the Black Panther movie, which I could 
rant about that movie for the whole time, but that's not why we're here. But Black Panther was essentially a film uh, co-produced with the Department of Defense alongside Disney uh, that, that centered a isolationist African monarchy that got access to a resource that allowed them to drastically develop their technology. And when they got that resource, they were like, okay, we're just gonna hide and watch the entire rest of the continent get wrecked and not help. And that is who we were taught to aspire to. And I understand why African people responded to it so positively because we're used to seeing images in media uh, and capitalist media that denigrate us, dehumanize us, uh, exploit us. And so seeing African people who were independent, who were dignified, who had a sense of who they were was like very, very powerful for us. But when you really like peel apart what that movie was doing by elevating that monarchy, by making a CIA agent the hero, uh, by demonizing revolutionary African politics, particularly uh, militant struggle, it was a really insidious piece of propaganda. Uh, uh, and then even things like Coming to America, which, you know, I like that movie, it's funny. But again, it's a particular image of Africa that is centered on material wealth, that is centered on monarchy. In reality, the vast majority of Africans living on the continent, the vast majority of Africans in history were not kings and queens. We were workers, we were peasants, we were priests, we were teachers, you know what I'm saying? Like we weren't monarchy. So why is this the dominant image of Africa that we see in capitalist media? The parallel to this, the parallel to this is that when the reality of Africa is discussed, when the reality of African people is discussed, we oftentimes see straight up enemies of Africa elevated in these commemorations, elevated in Black History Month, elevated in capitalist media. We see the worship of people like the Obamas. Barack Obama saw the drastic expansion of the US military footprint in Africa through the US uh, Africa Command. Barack Obama was responsible for helping to give millions of dollars in military weapons to police agencies across the United States that brutalize Africans in our own communities. AFRICOM engaged in the same work in the African continent, arming, training, and funding counter-revolutionary military and police forces to brutally repress African people resisting neocolonialism and imperialism. Barack Obama was terrible for Africa point blank period. Barack Obama is held up as a hero for us by these capitalist commemorations. Another example is uh, Paul Kagame out of Rwanda, darling of the West, someone who's been in Vogue magazine and is, is an example of like a civilized African. But Paul Kagame is exp uh, uh, complicit in the looting of resources from Central Africa, complicit in Western black genocides in Central Africa. He is truly a piece of crap, but he's held up as a hero by this system, held up as a hero by a lot of us to be quite honest with you. And at the same time, as we see straight up enemies of Africa elevated, we also see Africa's true heroes, the revolutionaries produced by our mass movements, either demonized, like in the case of Woody Mandela or Robert Mugabe or Sekou Toure, or straight up a race, like when it comes to uh, uh, Robert Sabukwe out of Bazania. So the enemies are held up as something for us to aspire to. They get magazine covers, they get coins, they get paintings. And the true heroes are erased, demonized, and attacked. This is what we are dealing with with this neocolonial propaganda. What is happening is that people tend to wear, and this is, I'm talking about African people in the West, we tend to claim and wear Africa as an aesthetic. We tend to do this like surface level, surface level engagement with the continent, again, focused on consumption, again, focused on materialism, again, focused on these people who are elevated because of their complicity with the exploitation of the continent, we don't actually face the truth of what is happening to Africa as, and why. We don't face the truth of who is doing it and why and who is trying to stop it. And the reason why we are doing this is because we have been pushed to do so by a capitalist imperialist system that wants to spread individualism, that wants to spread materialism and consumption, that wants us focused on this like glittering lie. So we ignore what that system is doing to our home, to our mother. And so what we need to do is reject any kind of engagement with Africa, any kind of Afrocentrism or even Pan-Africanism that does not engage with the actual political and material reality of the African continent, that does not engage with what capitalism and imperialism are doing to our home and doing to us. We have to deal with the reality of what Africa is and what is being done to Africa, period. It is not enough to take on the look and feel 
of Africa, to claim an African identity, even to take an African name, it's not enough. We have to learn about the real Africa. We have to learn about the destruction and devastation that capitalism and imperialism has wrought upon Africa. We have to educate ourselves about who is doing it. We have to organize collectively on a mass basis to stop it, period. Otherwise, we have no right to claim Africa. We have to fight for our mother. So that is what I want to say today. All right, that was dope. Thank you, thank you. Um, so yeah, everybody now can um, come on the screen. Um, we're about to um, ask the entire panel questions. Um, they already given us wonderful words, so we're just gonna keep that going. <clears throat> Is that everyone cool? All right, so um, as y'all were talking, y'all y'all were naming a lot of like stuff that doesn't get left in history. I was just thinking about, and also talking about how this this gets weaponized against us and i was thinking about um i forgot to say this at the beginning there was a sto story that came out where um brian flores he's a nfl or former nfl football coach he was suing the nfl for discrimination um up against black coaches and then nfl hired um former ag attorney general um loretta lynch who was the first black woman attorney general <laughs> of the united states uh to defend to defend them against against them um in this case and i know none of this is radical but it's just interesting that even something as simple as him just trying to work on discrimination um they go and find they go and find a um, a first black to do that so um in reference to that um what um uh, african achievements and accomplishments if any should we be celebrating and commemorating to move beyond um black first or first blacks <clears throat> and that's for anybody Okay. Um, well, I, go ahead, go you want to go? Oh, well, a few things. Well, first, I want to say, um, my, I know Loretta Lynch from uh, Baltimore City, uh, like uh, you know, uh, firsthand experience with the consent decree. Um, so always pro police. So not surprised um, if you know her legal history. Um, but also today is Huey P. Newton's birthday, right? So I think we should recognize that. Um, that's that's what we should be celebrating. That's the direction. That's what we should be not not just celebrating because I think we should be um, studying, right? Because I think we want to. The intent of the piece that we wrote was to move away from highlighting individuals, right? It wasn't just Huey. It was the party that made Huey. It was the study that made Huey. It was the struggle that made Huey. So I mean, that's one that's one example I can give. I couldn't find the mute. Um, so yeah, I would say to move beyond the first black, we have to learn who our actual heroes are. Like right now, it's very, very in fashion. If you get on Twitter, you can find someone just straight up attacking random African revolutionaries. Like I've seen them go for MLK. I've seen them go for Asada. I've seen them go for Harriet Tubman. I've seen them go for Nkrumah, Black Panther Party. If you are an African that fought for the liberation of our people, that made great sacrifices for the liberation of our people, in 2022, you are getting attacked on Twitter and people think they're doing that from the left. And in reality, it's just pure reaction. And so what we need to do uh, as people in the struggle, as Africans and revolutionary organizations who know this history, is study these people, learn from their work, like learn the truth of their political beliefs and then be unapologetic about spreading the word. Like that's the uh, uh, Sally who mentioned that we just screened a documentary about Fannie Lou Hamer and we talked about her trip to Guinea, sponsored by Saku Toure, uh, with other members of SNCC that like shaped a lot of their political development. Like that's the kind of history we have to be surfacing and telling people about. And we can't concede any ground to these folks who seek to attack our revolutionaries, period. Like we have to understand they're humans. They made mistakes. That's just the reality situation. We're humans, we're gonna make mistakes, but they were still good. They still fought for us. They should still be respected and learned from, period. So like stop focusing on the first blacks focus on the folks who actually fought for us and tell the truth about them in as many spaces as possible yeah i just want to quickly build on what 
on your son who just said and something on your son who said a little earlier in her presentation is that you know we have criteria out here to determine who's for real and who's not so you know if we look at it with a lot of people are saying pan-african i'm a pan-africanist i'm a socialist that's why the study is so important you all because we have to understand the criteria that makes it legitimate for you to claim those identifications for yourself. Because if somebody's saying they're Pan-Africanist and they're patriarchal and homophobic and pro-capitalist, they're not Pan-Africanist. So we have to understand that. And if we know that criteria, then that brings us to the correct people that we should be looking at and giving respect to. Sister Carlotta, who was kidnapped in Nigeria on the slave ship and brought to Cuba and raised a rebellion that almost overthrew the monarchy in Cuba hundreds of years ago at the sugar plantation there. Um, people like that, Nanny of the Maroons, the Qualimbo communities in Brazil, we have a number of, of people who have always resisted our oppression. We got to, you know, this nonsense, I'm not like my ancestors. Well, who the hell are you like if you're not like your ancestors? You know, people, I if I if it was slavery now, I would be doing this. You wouldn't be doing a damn thing. But yes, the boss, what you want me to do next, boss? Because that's what you're doing right now. So knowing like the criteria, like there has to be things people are doing. And we have so many people who have would never bow down, refuse to bow down. And we all, the, the information is all around us. We just have to pick it, almost we can pick it out of the stratosphere and study it. And those are the people that we should lift up. You want that one, Salifa, or you, or you think he got it? He got it? Yeah, I think he got it. Uh, <laughs> all right, uh, another one. Um, so in y'all essay, uh, why we say uh, fuck Black History Month, um, Y'all write, uh, quote, the great month that Carter G. Woodson established to raise political consciousness of his people and instill a feeling of pride has been weaponized against us, end quote. Um, so what is the relationship, if any, between commodifying and co-opting things like Black History Month, Juneteenth? I would even throw in um, I would even throw in uh, Black August. I think there's a there's a s s slow uptick to try to co-opt that. And um, say and then say like AFRICOM, the 10 through three program um, and deadly exchange programs. In other words, what is the relationship between cultural imperialism, warmongering, and state violence? And again, that's for anybody. <clears throat> I can start on this one if that's cool. Go ahead. All right. So in that in that same piece, closer to the, the bottom, at the end of the essay, uh, I made a point to quote the Imam Jamil al -Amin, because he says in uh, Die Nigger Die, uh, white people will co-op dog shit if it's to their advantage. That's something that we see is very clearly done. It doesn't matter what the institution is that you create or what you name it. If the bones of the thing can be co-opted, white people are going to co-opt it, which is why it's so important to talk about ideology. That's something that we are constantly talking about all the time when Erica is talking about like identity reductionism and all these things. It's like, yes, it's black. Uh, the uh, uh, the imam he also says you know to be black is sufficient um to be to, to be to be to be black is sufficient but it's not enough right it's like great great it's great you're black all right next like is there anything else that comes along with this are you a liberal are you a conservative are you a communist like what's the what's 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 the meat of this thing right and so i think when you think about that and you start talking about things like africom for example what we know as, as we've already pointed out in this presentation is that george bush created africom but Barack Obama took AFRICOM to, to levels that George Bush could only dream about. And the reason why Barack Obama was so successful, who was so successful in spreading AFRICOM deeper and deeper and deeper into the continent was because of the identity, because of the because of the skin, because because of the 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 cultural, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever it is. And so even when you look today, like that, that TikTok girl, for example, the jury is still out on whether or not that's just some kind of micro influencer campaign from the CIA, honestly, just trying to get young African people on TikTok spreading State Department talking points and like misinformation. When you look at the if the, when you look at the uh, commercials and the advertisements that organizations like the CIA, who Ajamu calls the criminals in action, that's my favorite name for them. Um, when you look at organizations like the CIA, the FBI, even down to just the run of the mill police, everybody's recruiting based on some, some diversity pocket, 
right now, right? So it's all about get get the black faces up, get the women up, get the queer people up. They've gone as far to be like one of the one of the ads was like, "I'm a millennial with social anxiety" or some dumb shit like that. You know what I mean? It's like whatever you can do to like co-op and appropriate the things that people are struggling with or dealing with or trying to navigate. That's how that works. And so, yeah. So Africom, uh, we gonna have NATO mascots soon i feel like that that TikTok girl honestly was the first and, and we should get prepared for some more so yeah i just i just have a quick story that you inspired me salifu so years ago i live in sacramento california and years ago in the all african people's revolutionary party we did african liberation day we do it in a number of places and we did it this was one of the cities where we did it and when we first started doing it when i first joined in the mid 80s you know we struggled to get 15 20 people but we built on it and after a while we began to get thousands of people to come and we got even muta baruka to come one year tupac wrapped here one year at african liberation day so it, it became big and we would go to kinko's to print off materials at that time. It's pre-internet, so just understand that. And so we would go to Kinko's and we would spend hundreds of dollars printing off materials at Kinko's. So one time we were there, this is when Kinko's was 24 hours, I don't know if they are anymore, but one time we were there at like one or two in the morning printing off these materials. There were like four of us. And the, the person helping us says, can, can you hold on for a moment? And they went in the back and the manager came out and the manager said, you know, you all do so much of this and he had taken one of our pictures of Kwame Nkrumah and Sekretary and he had, I don't even know what he did, glossarized it or something. And he showed it to us and he was like, we can help you make a winning revolution here at Kinko's. And he started showing us these plans, like thousand dollar printing plans. And it was a, it was a phenomenal lesson for me because when I was listening to him, I was thinking, these people don't care anything about what your politics are, they're gonna always be trying to find a way to capitalize off of it and make money off of it. So the lesson I learned that night is that these, these capitalists, they know that we're gonna resist. So their strategy is get out in front of the resistance and frame it. And that's what Black History Month, Juneteenth, that's what they're doing with all these things. They're trying to frame what resistance looks like. So that instead of us seeing it as a total overthrow of the slave master who's causing every problem we have in our lives, we should just see it as one lone token Negro um, eating potato chips in a restaurant and that we should all aspire to do that and then getting in a Tesla and driving away. And that's what we should all see that as freedom. Is this still open or are we moving on? Oh, it's still open. If you want to answer, go uh, ahead. Yeah, yeah, because I, I do. I just want to shout out Margaret Kimberly uh, for this week's bar piece on Terrell Star, um, because I think that piece ultimately discusses um, that sort of counterinsurgency um, that we're noting that's happening. That's um, because of the way that he maneuvers, um, the ties to because he does have ties to community, but he also has ties to <laughs> the Atlantic Council apparently. But I mean, his role. Uh, what Salifu was saying, you know, eventually we're going to have, you know, Black NATO cheerleaders. Well, that's, that's the role. And I think that we have to be well aware that how these people, you know, to, to, to speak about Ukraine and to speak about Russia, never have any conversation about AFRICOM, never have any conversation about the 1033, never talk about Southcom. Those are things that we have to be aware of when people are like dipping in, like dabbling into geopolitics, right? Where they want to be the black face of the geopolitics um, or where they want to be the pundit. I think we also have to be aware of black punditry and mainstream media that sort of, that influence the role that they now play. They are literally reading State Department memos. Um, it's like from CNN, when we talk about Ukraine, you turn on embassy, we see and they're talking about Beijing and then you, vice versa. And that's a cycle all the time. And then when you have Black people come on board and come on and say these things without any opposition, there's no opposition um, in that framing. And they cycle you into the Democratic line. We watched that happen with uh, at how the uprising got overtaken. So, you know, <laughs> the entire the entirety of the uprising was a cultural thing, right? Everybody came out with Black Lives Matter. Um, Juneteenth was a big thing because of it. Um, 
and then it got co-opted and drafted and funneled into the Democratic Party line. And that is where we find ourselves stuck. So wherever the Democratic Party is, that is where we're moving under the guise that this is the party for Black people. And I think that that's what we have to be aware of, how these figures play these sort of counterintelligence roles um, beyond neocolonialism, right? Because a lot of them don't even have that sort of political influence, but they do have influence on the people. And we need to be aware of that. All right, thank you. Um, so y'all been, y'all been talking a bit about uh, co-optation um, and even even like in the summer of 2020 and how that uh, gets funneled into the Democratic Party. But like, what are some of the internal contradictions that lead to co-optation? Because like, so for one moment, people can be burning down a police station and the next thing they're, um, to use CBS's words, they're cha-cha sliding for um, Joe Biden and Kamala. Like, how do you... What are the internal contradictions within within our our world? I'm not even talking about what the state does that 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 allows that to um, that to play out. I definitely think a major factor is the domination of petty bourgeois leadership within African communities. And like, first off, like petty bourgeois is not an inherently reactionary identity. It's like a class position. So you can be revolutionary petty bourgeois, like Amakal Cabral, Kwame Nkrumah. Or you can be a reactionary petty bourgeois, like most of the ones that we deal with in the United States. And so the problem is that they represent the majority of the leadership of the political organizations that exist for us as African people. And they are most invested in protecting what they have and getting more. So what happens is that when a moment of mass mobilization happens, like the George Floyd uprising last summer, the petty bourgeois and their organizations are most uh, positioned to direct the political direction of the, of those movements. Like when you are seeing like mass spontaneous mobilizations uh, where people are just like outraged and they want to express their frustration, they want to express their anger and they go in the streets um, because that is not a mobilization that has been organized by like a, a, a distinct political party with an ideology and a strategy. What happens is the people who are the most organized, who have the most resources are able to like shift where it goes. And so that's how we got from people, you know, burning down police stations um, uh, calling for abolishing the police, even calling for the reformist demand of uh, 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 defunding the police to voting for a cop and a pilgrim. Like this is why this keeps happening because the petty bourgeois dominate political leadership in our communities in the United States. And so what we need to do um, as revolutionary African people is like start at the grassroots, start at the grassroots. Like we have to organize bases among our people. We have to engage in systematic political education to raise the consciousness of our people. So that's not just us being like, don't trust those people. They can recognize why they shouldn't trust those people. And we also have to pair that systematic political education with strategies of community defense so that we have or are organizing conscious communities and we are also organizing communities that can meet their own needs. Oh yeah, you really just said it all. I wanted to like double down on your point about political education because we are in this moment right now where, as you know, hood communist has had to battle that ten. We had to battle that tendency a lot on Twitter before we got kicked off. But people are just straight up like hate reading. They're just like stop telling people to read. That's elitist, as Dr. CBS calls it, literist. Like, and it's it's one. It's honestly one of the nasty side effects of sort of that tendency to lift up people instead of organizations um, that like, as I was trying to mention, because inside of organizations, when you are involved in a consistent, healthy political education process, you can identify those kinds of tendencies that exist where they are. And then you can start to engage in processes of criticism, self-criticism to weed those things out, to like separate them and be able to move in an opposite direction. But this intense focus on getting people to believe that reading is not in our best benefit is separating us from lessons that we should have, that have been taught and there, there, were, there are things that we learned in the 60s. There are things that we learned in the 30s that we act every year like they're brand new revelations. And they were literally right there for us to engage with all the time. Yeah, you know, we have to always remember also that the African bourgeoisie, as small as it is, and the African petty bourgeoisie, that was opened up. It's always been there, but it was really opened up 
by the capitalist ruling class to create a buffer class, particularly the African petty bourgeoisie to keep us in line. So today, you know, you have African billionaires in Africa, Akita, Don Goti, and these other people are billionaires. You know, this didn't, this was not a thing 20 years ago. And you have an entire African petty bourgeoisie class here. And a lot of these celebrities are spokespersons for this class and their role is to keep us focused on trying to make it on an individual level within the capitalist system. Don't pay any attention to what's happening with the masses or people. If they can't make it, it's because they're lazy and there's something wrong with them. They, you know, they eat too much fried chicken, whatever the problem is. Your, your goal is to make it in the capitalist system. And that's the role of the African petty bourgeoisie. And like Onyesamu said, they can commit class suicide and become revolutionary intelligentsia, but most of them today are content to just sit here and feed off of the master's trough. And a great example was the summer of 2020 when the NBA players were gonna strike. If y'all remember, they were gonna march when, when Jacob Blake was shot. They, they, stopped, they stopped the playoff games and they were gonna strike and you had household name players like Kawhi Leonard and LeBron James saying we aren't going to play another game. And what happened? Barack Obama brought his rusty behind in there and told him, don't strike, vote. And this was his role. That's his role. That's what he's there to do. And that's what they always do. And we have to, we can't just continue to be hoodwinked by that. We got to understand he didn't, that's what he, he did his job. So now it's our responsibility to do our job. All right. Um, okay, I'm gonna ask y'all one more question. We're gonna um, open it up to the Q and A. Um, so we've talked, you know, we've we've leveled some uh, good critiques here about you know how this tends to play out this so so called Black History Month. So, like, and I know y'all, and we call it African Liberation Month. So thinking internationally, um, what are some issues, events, and or struggles currently happening in, in the African world that we can use uh, African Liberation Month to draw attention to and focus our political education on. And uh, re relatedly, how can uh, African Liberation Month be used to um, anti-imperialist and decolonial ends? I feel like our paper answered that question. <laughs> Roughly, um, there are so many, so many individual issues that you not really necessary many pocket issues happening at the same time um, on the continent, in the Caribbean, and so um, that focus, like this, this best man, like what we talk about on the world of the continent, the understood struggles. Um, yeah, good. Uh, you breaking up a little bit. Somebody else wants to take that until she uh, gets it, gets her audio figured out. Erica, you Google. Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you now. All right. Yeah. So, um, understand the role that Africom plays. If we look at what's happening with Southcom um, in that region, this guy in alone um, being where Operation Trade Winds is happening, the role that Guyana is playing as far as being uh, all the military interventions and, and all the military training that's happening on that um, in that nation, and strategically the role that Guyana plays where it is in reference to Venezuela. We know that what uh, the U.S. is doing to Venezuela, and um, in addition to Cuba, Nicaragua, Haiti, um, so there's so many ways that we can tap in and pay attention, but I think um, BAP's work alone helps us navigate the areas and connect and, and you know, um, focus and zoom in on where we can actually make a difference or have some beneficial significance in. Man, I'm always going up, I'm always going to uplift. Um, Kuba in every space that I'm in, wherever I can, because as I have learned from sitting around listening to Onye, from engaging and reading, and then from recently being able to go and see the island for myself, 
Kuwa is an African nation, when we start talking about the African world, when we talk about the African diaspora, you absolutely have to think of of Cuba because Cuba absolutely thinks about itself as a part like intrinsically tied to Africa and what the United States is doing to to Cuba is nothing short of genocide of an African nation whenever people talk about Joe Biden whenever when people discuss Joe Biden look at Joe Biden you should not see him as anything less than a murderer what he's doing what every U.S. president who comes into that office and refuses to undo that blockade to Cuba is is a murderer they are genociders and to think about them as anything less is straight up genocide denial that is an African island full of African people who love Africa and they are being punished for the crime of nothing more than fighting for their right to self-determination. And that is important for African people in the States to understand because once we get our shit together and actually begin to seriously engage in that fight, the same things are going to happen to us in ways that, and many of those things are already happening to us. And his, Cuba has historically provided support for anti-colonial struggles of African people in the United States and throughout the continent. So that's another reason why we should work with them. Do we not want that help again? We should want it. Um, but in terms of other struggles, I feel like it's really important to like continuously connect the domestic to the global. And Black Alliance for Peace is like one of the, the best organizations in terms of doing that on a consistent basis. And so uh, for this past week, there have been mass mobilizations of Africans in Haiti protesting against slave wages and sweatshops run by U.S. clothing corporations like Hanes, like Target, uh, places where we buy our clothes all the time, uh, make them in Haiti for pennies. And the minimum wage in Haiti was deliberately depressed by U.S. trade agreements. So those Africans have been rising up by the thousands for over a week. You will not hear a peep about it on the U.S. news. And if we consider that here in the United States, we've seen a resurgence of the labor movement, particularly among service workers that work fast food, that work retail, why we need to connect those struggles. Like the people making the clothes in the stores are fighting for better wages and healthcare. And the people that are working in the stores that sell the clothes are fighting for better wages and better healthcare. And there's a clear basis of solidarity there that we can build upon. Other examples are uh, uh, the, the keep it in the ground movement, uh, 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 movements against environmental destruction and seeking a, a rational response to climate change. We have indigenous peoples all over the Western hemisphere uh, fighting to stop oil extraction, fighting to stop mining. And the same thing is happening in Africa. Many of these same corporations that are destroying the planet are drilling for oil off the south of, off the south coast of Africa, are, 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 are building extremely dangerous facilities that blow up on a regular basis and kill people in Nigeria. Uh, there was recently a mining company that uh, transported explosives in an extremely unsafe manner in Ghana and ended up blowing up an entire town. And so we have to understand when we're talking about keeping in the ground, we're talking about climate justice, we're talking about a just response to climate change. Indigenous people are the front line of defense against environmental destruction, and that includes indigenous people in Africa, period. Keep it in the ground, it needs to be a global movement. Oh, also, uh, the, the masses of African people in Mali just pushed out the French military. We should figure out how they did that. We should learn from their example. We should see how we can support that effort because AFRICOM is still there, UN forces are still there, NATO forces are still there. So the boot is not off their necks, but they are fighting back and we have to play our position. Yeah, I was just going to say, I agree 100%. Obviously, I think a good place to start is all of the countries that the United Snakes has sanctions against. And we've named a lot of them, um, Cuba, North Korea, um, these are Zimbabwe, you know, anytime the US like Malcolm X told us anytime anybody they have a problem with, and they're trying to organize against, you know, that's because that's somebody who is on the side of the masses of humanity. So it's good to that's a good place to start like look at any of or all of those places and look at it. I know, here locally, in the APRP, we we're, we've developed a thing where we're trying to adopt one of our sibling parties in Africa. So right now it's the Zimbabwe movement for Pan-African Socialists. So we've been raising money through our programs for them and to just Western Union them some money, which we did two weeks ago, it's taken, it took like almost two weeks for them to get the money. And the comrades there, I'm in constant contact with them. It took them so much to just get this little money 
you know, because of these stupid sanctions. And then somebody sent me this state from Treasury Department. I didn't even answer them. I don't, you know, but I mean, I think we have to, you know, this is what they're trying to do is destabilize the forces on earth that are trying to organize for justice. And the way they do it is through their sanctions, uh, their, their, their sanctions program. So, you know, we should learn as much as we can about that and get engaged with organizations that are doing work to stop this and prevent it from sabotaging, He's killing people with what they're doing and prevent it from being able to do that. All right, thank you all for all of that. Um, yeah, that's, that was a great discussion. So we're gonna um, we're gonna finally open it up to um, uh, to, to the Q and A. I see we got a bunch of questions, and I'm going to uh, bring on uh, Dr. CBS. Uh, she's gonna open up our, our, the first questions from the Q and A. Hey y'all! Uh, I didn't realize I was on screen yet. My bad. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna batch questions. We have quite a bit, and so we'll ask two or three <clears throat> at a time, sort of questions that have synergies, and then um, open it up to um, our distinguished panelists to respond. So here's the first set of questions. The first one is: What are some effective ways y'all recommend to begin properly practicing African Liberation Month in spaces where Black excellence? and the celebration of the Black first is prevalent? And then relatedly, what does celebrity have to do with this first Blacks thing? How does celebrity dampen or chill revolutionary action? And how do we combat that? And then finally, revolutionary ideology and history aren't included in mass media markets. How do we push our messages to the masses of Africans given this possible barrier of access, plus the oversaturation of the petty bouge? So that's the first step. Not gonna lie, you might have to do it, repeat the questions for me again. <laughs> but um, uh, I can I can tackle, I can try to tackle them. Can you just say the first one again for me? Yeah, so the first one has to do with how do we practice African Liberation Month when in spaces of where black excellence and black firsts are prevalent that relates to how does celebrity link to the black first thing? And then also how do we disseminate our revolutionary ideology to the masses when it's not presented in mass media? So those are the sort of three questions. Okay. Well, first off, I do wanna say that um, I don't think it was ever in, ma in mass. Like I don't think we ever had any real control over how we were able to obtain, I guess, revolutionary works. Um, I think there's still sort of barriers around that. I mean, the Kruma books are like a hundred dollars <laughs> in some instances. So I think that there, there's always been some barriers, but I know um, with my work, what I try to do, I mean, I just wanna say, I think the whole anti-CRT reaction to it is it's ridiculous for me because I think that as a people, we've always long sought to have that sort of community control of education. If you're listening to what people are saying, that's exactly what they're asking for and they're talking about, but they're, they're not really understanding that that's what they're asking for and, and talking about. So that the access to all of these things have always been limited, um, hence my, my program. But I think that if we're trying to establish an African Liberation Month, there's, there's plenty of small things that we could do at a time, like these conversations that we're having, um, amongst each other that's one way that we you know break the mold and and start to sort of ship away at the idea of what we think black history month is or how or what we even know about black history month um i know in the, initially what two black was talking about a lot of that stuff i had no idea about so i think that these little conversations amongst each other um bringing resources to one another is how you start that and then you can start that in organizational processes i also think that when we highlight it, you know, when we do group events, there's always, you know, make it a, a black, an African Liberation Month event. It doesn't have to be a Black History Month event and, you know, chip away at that. But I think that the culture of celebrity um, is so overwhelming because of the way that we are sort of trapped in, in a social media space um, as a generation. I think that we've come up with that sort of celebrity gaze, a lot of us before we even have the politics that we do have. So even the breaking away from it now is a little challenging for some. Like people would have, you know, that anti-capitalist politics, but still be like, you know, oh my God, Rihanna's pregnant, you know, <laughs> like very, very excited, um, you know? 
in spite of what she's you know said about Palestine recently, I ain't forget. Um, <laughs> but it's it's so enclosed that Eddie and like that's how we think that's the mentality. Even the the NFL coaches, right? That becomes now our struggle in the midst of overwhelming labor strikes right there's so many labor strikes going on across the country but the big conversation now is but what about the black nfl coaches so i think that understanding the role of celebrity um and clarifying that helps us understand you know it helps us chip away but i think that these conversations are really where it's at i think these conversations in these sort of small groups of political education really helps us formulate an idea of how to emphasize African liberation. Can I answer the first one real quick? Um, so when it comes to trying to institutionalize and celebrate African liberation, month, something that I really recommend people really try to hone in on is kids. If you have access to any children in your life, you don't have to be a teacher, you have to have access to a classroom. If you have nieces, nibblings, cousins, anything like that, yo, I have a, an African Liberation Day presentation that I made for kids last year. I'll give you my email. I will send it to you. Explaining these things to kids is not nearly as difficult sometimes as you think it would be because they haven't been propagandized their entire lives against the idea of being African. Many of them have never heard anybody call them African before, but the first time you say to them that they are African, they're going to be very intrigued. And I feel like we spend a lot of time arguing and fighting with grown ass people who are convinced and are telling you straight up they are never going to see themselves as African. They have no desire to be a part of the African world. We need to let them go and do their own thing and like really try to, because I think about so many things that are important and special to me now as like a grown ass man. And they're little things that people said to me in passing as a kid. You might sit down with two or three of your cousins at a computer and just and show them that presentation or tell them something about somebody in African history. And like they, it might seem like they half get it at the moment, but as they grow and as they develop, they will build on that idea idea that's something that we really need to do more of because the kids are right there like they're right there and we be ignoring them sometimes i agree with everything that's been said um specifically to the question of like how mass media uh is reactionary and how our true stories are not told on that platform uh like we know that for a fact like ajamu said the only time they're ever going to talk about uh african organizations african political figures is to find a way to get in front of our resistance and redirect it. So we know for a fact that they're never going to tell the truth about the African Revolution. They're never going to tell the truth about African revolutionaries or African revolutionary organizations. And so what we need to do is make our own platforms. And that's precisely why we started Hood Communist, because we recognized there was like a gap. Like we needed an anti-imperialist, revolutionary socialist, revolutionary nationalist youth voice uh, uh, to like to, to talk about these issues in ways that the masses of our people could understand. Um, so we can build our own platforms, whether it be like the last of intellectual, Black Power Media, Black Miss podcast, uh, uh, Name IP, we have several podcasts, Ajamu does one, we have the For Whatever podcast, we have Weekly Pan-African News, Our Ancestors Voices, like we have to build our own media platforms. And even if the audience you reach is super small, you will immediately start to see a shift, like Weekly Pan-African News probably gets like 200 viewers an episode, and like compared to uh uh like reactionary youtube videos or celebrity youtube videos like we are much 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 smaller but when we go into our community and talk to people they're watching it they're asking us questions about it they're showing it to their families because we're talking in ways they can understand so regardless of how small the audience is at first we have to create our own platforms that we control and use them to tell the truth i say and i would say to the question of ideology that we have to we have to really work to demystify ideology to our people, demystify the concept of ideology, like the way the capital system has trained us. Like people will stand in front of you and say, "Well, I don't deal with ideology." And you know, when I was a young young man in Ghana, the elder woman I lived with, she told me, "Boy, everything you do is political. Everything has an idea. You go to the bathroom, there's an idea behind it." And so we have to just demystify that. And and a good way to do that is just to take concepts and break them down, you know, in just very everyday ways that people can understand them. So, you know, we have this Saturday work we do here in the park, 
And, you know, this is California. So, you know, everything's gang culture. So a lot of the people that participate come from that affiliation. So, you know, they sit there and we have readings and we're talking and they, you know, we always have these conversations like, you know, what is this thing you're talking about, about collectivism? And so we explain to them, well, look at you, you know, and your blood set. Like, do you have a leader? No, we don't have no leader. We don't nobody tell us what to do. I'm like, part of that's cultural. Part of that is cultural. You know, the Aryan Brotherhood has shot callers. The Mexican Mafia has shot callers. Bloods and Crips don't have that. That's a cultural thing because our people's culture is a collective culture. And we say that to them. And then they're like, what? I, you mean we're practicing African culture? I'm like, well, the that part. The other stuff y'all do is, is it capitalist culture. And that's what we got to deal with. But yeah, I mean, just it opens up a great conversation. And it's not that difficult. Like they didn't have to read Kwame Nkrumah's consciousness to come to understand that. They, the idea is to get them there eventually. But right now we can just take basic concepts and we can talk about them in everyday language. And our people are not stupid. People can understand what we're talking about when it's something that serves our interests as a people. All right, um, so we got two more questions here. Um, so this is the first question. I'll read it slow uh, so y'all don't forget. Um, so uh, how can we uh, effectively organize while entrenched in capitalism? This is part one of the first question. Uh, folks aren't all talking, or folks aren't all taking Cadillac money. I guess that's in reference to, um, what's her name? I want Tamika Mallory. Um, but a lot of local organizers really lack sufficient means for even small projects and programs. So again, how can we effectively organize while entrenched in capitalism? Saying everybody's not, essentially everybody's not a sellout, but people do struggle with resources. <clears throat> and then the second question, um, trying to uh, change the color of people to operate the institutions now in capitalist system into being operated by black brown people only accepts our colonization, the shopping stores, the schools, the legislators, the jobs, the way we've been done here in the U.S. doing it, but by black people is no change from our colonization. How can we imagine, quote, not capitalism? I will say, so my experience, I joined the all African People's Revolutionary Party eight years ago. I was actually recruited by a job. And uh, we have a mandatory work study process, which is like a collective and systematic process of political education, but we also engage in community work. And like one of the first community defense programs I was ever a part of was a free breakfast program organized by the Oregon chapter of the All African People's Revolutionary Party that was modeled after the Black Panther Party's breakfast program. When we first um, developed the idea to do this, which we developed by just like knocking on people's doors and talking to them in an African neighborhood and asking them what they needed, um, I was like, I don't actually know if we can do this. Because I was like, we don't have any money. <laughs> um, we've met, a lot of us have like never done this before. I had never done it before. And so I was like, I understand the concept, but I didn't understand how to get from point A to point B, especially without resources, right? But what I experienced as we started to build this program to tell African people about it, to like win their support because they trusted us and they believe what we were saying, um, was that people would like come out of the woodwork to help. Like we needed to get food. We got like a local organization, Food Not Bombs, was like we'll get you food. Um, when we were knocking door to door, we were talking about like the trauma that the youth experience and like therapists were like, I can help, I can do group sessions. Um, we needed a space and we just met an, an African from Jamaica that had like a coffee shop and he's like, you can do it here. So like when we decided to do this program and made it clear that we were serious and that we were gonna move forward with it, people started throwing in their support. Then we went on to build a school same situation. I came here to Tiwa territory to Albuquerque, New Mexico. We decided uh, we had a comrade that had a plot of land that they just said we could use. And we were like, let's build a garden. We had no money. We probably spent $50 out of pocket and everything else was like us talking about why we wanted to do this. What was like the, the connection to our, pol our political objective and people being like, I support that. How can I help? I'll give you seeds. I'll give you dirt. Someone gave us like a, a pickup truck full of like uh, goat poop, which was very useful actually. They helped us like build a fence, like they helped us build beds, like no money, $50 out of pocket, we were still able to accomplish this. And what I have realized is that you don't actually need the resources up front. You need the vision and the organization to accomplish it. And you need to build the trust among the community you're building that project for, so they want to help you do it. 
it's not that we have a lack of resources in the African community, like we're poor, but people can contribute what they have to build these things. It's that we're not organized and we're not conscious of the need to build these things. So I think the first step is actually ideological and political and the rest sort of like comes on its own. Yeah, I just want to co-sign that quickly. Absolutely. Like it's all about once you have a program and our people know it's sincere, they see you working in the community, they will give. I mean, I had when we started, we asked for the donations for the Zimbabwe movement for Pan-African Socialists. People were sending five dollars. I had a conversation with an elderly sister and she said, I don't have baby. I ain't got but a few pennies, but I'm going to give this five dollars. Our people will get them. We will find a way like we do to keep the lights on and do everything else. We, we are resourceful people and we got it. You know, they, they get us convinced that we live under this scarcity model and there's not enough. And yeah, of course, with no question, capitalism hoards the wealth. We know that, but our people will find a way to support things that they believe in and are invested in. We don't need, we don't need nonprofit money. We don't need any of that. We just need, as Huey P. Newton said, the, the 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 people's will the man's technology will never match the will of the people okay so i'll ask the next set of questions i just want to say two things number one is the revolution is not a shakedown so all this putting the cash app and the venmos and the thing and calling that redistribution and reparations that ain't it and secondly um that collective approach we need to see that as we, we often do that in times of crisis, but we need to normalize it as how we actually relate to one another, right? Just wanted to throw that in there. Okay, so two more questions. How do you teach or inform others of gender variant African revolutionaries in their politics, so ones that are not cis? And then to the list of righteous African-American revolutionary women mentioned so far, I'd like to add the recently departed ancestor, Bell Hooks whose real theoretical and political legacy, in my view, has yet to be appreciated, especially by many African-American male revolutionaries. The question is, why? So again, one is about how to lift up um, gender variant African revolutionaries, and one is about why Bell Hooks' legacy hasn't been appreciated, especially by um, male revolutionaries. Go, Erica. Um, well, I feel like with anything, I, even with what I talked about, right? When we talk about uplifting certain people, we really have to talk about their politics and their ideology, because I don't, I think at this point in time, a lot of people are getting uplifted, right? I don't think that we're at a point now where we can talk about um, diversity um in that way anymore i think that there's a lot of diverse reactionaries at this point um because we never address the ideology or the politics um like i i mean for example i i always say about uh rustin right we talk about rustin specifically because that's a queer man um and there's a lack of that conversation or a lack of that representation in the conversation, right? But then there's no real investigation about his politics, which is antithetical to revolutionary politics, um, aside from how we we understand and how we learn them. Um, even with uh, Marsha, right? They talk about Marsha only with the brick. There's no mention of the several organizations that she not only founded, but was a part of um the plethora of people that she's housed i mean there's no real there's no real conversation about that there's conversation about or debate rather about the brick right so i think that if we want to see people uplifted we really need to question what does it even mean to be uplifted who like who are we lifting them for right what is the purpose of that and then two um what is the politics i think i think elaine brown caught some shit because I, I believe that that was the intention of, of what what was trying to be said. I mean, you know, people are not going to always say everything the best way, but I think that the point was raised that needed to be raised because when we look back now at the, at the CIA um, video, right? They're, they're not missing that. There's very, there's a lot of gender variant people represented, 
You know, there's a lot of people, uh, race, nationalities, all types of diverse people represented. So I think when we're talking about uplifting, we have to be mindful of who and for what and the purpose. And then also to bell hooks, I think also um, it, it applies there too. What, what is the intention of, of seeing bell hooks the way that we we need to see bell hooks, right? Because I think that, that bell hooks has a lot of scholarship that we could draw from, so much work that we could draw from. But I think also there's a lot of criticisms to be made about the work. Um, but, we, but that's something I think that we need to be able to struggle through though. And I think that there's, a, a, there's an aversion of that struggle because it's always antagonistic, right? It's either you hate all men <laughs> or, um, you know, so because it's antagonistic, people don't really engage the way they should. Um, because for, there was a there was a good wave of engagement of bell hooks up until the point that she criticized Beyonce, right? And then nobody needed bell hooks anymore. Um, so I think that that's something that we we need to consider and think about when we talk about figures and when we talk about individuals, right? Because I think a lot of this is we need to really stop raising individuals um, and really talk about collectives. I was just going to say something about the, the bell hooks piece, just speaking as a, you know, so-called cis African man who grew up in this patriarchal society in a very violent patriarchal environment. And my father was, you know, very patriarchal, good man, but he's very patriarchal. You know, my mother would speak and he, that's, I've spoken, that's it, you know, and, and that was the environment I grew up in and we all have grown up in. And my mother would perpetuate those values. You know, she, we had a, uh, she used to tell me all the time, son, don't get no black woman. She going to mistreat you. She going to do this. She going to do that. My mother used to tell me that. So we know it's systematic. So since it's systematic in the oppression of women and marginalized genders, it's going to translate to everything we do, including who we recognize and who we marginalize. And that's what happened. But I, I think the reason for pointing out my, you know, individual experience is that we can transform people away from that backward thinking. And I think a political education process or an ideological training ground is the basis to do that. Because my experiences as a young adult to the present day have been shaped by that. And it's not perfect, but it's a, it is a constant way to address that. When I myself and my mother, my daughter's mother got divorced in 1994, that's, she's 34 years old now. She's active in the movement, active in the party, active in everything. But that's because when we decided to get divorced, we did it in an African collective manner. It wasn't just she and I getting divorced. We had the All African Women's Revolutionary Union involved. A couple of weeks after we split up, sisters called me and we had to write a plan out. I had to write a plan for what I was going to do. And they called me like, your daughter Shakura has a birthday today. What are you going to do? And I'm like, I'm trying to decide if I'm going to go. I had given the money, but I didn't want to be subjected to what was going to be there from, you know, my ex's family. And, and the sisters that called me said, you, you need to go. There's no question you need to go and struggle with me for two hours. And I went. And I'm saying that that is the type of process that we need to normalize. And if we do that, we can begin to break down this backward behavior. Uh, it, it's nothing, I'm nothing special. It's just that we have to create institutions and processes in our communities that challenge this backward thinking. Um, I want to say on the question of like elevating gender variant revolutionaries and making sure that queer and trans people are included in the project of Pan-Africanism. I feel like there's like, there's main figures we know, like Marsha P. Johnson, uh, Audre Lorde, who actually took an African name, Gamba Adisa, uh, uh, actually, Carlotta uh, was a queer woman, Carlotta of Cuba. Like we know particular figures, but they're often like held up, like tokenized, kind of in the way that happens with Bayard Rustin uh, 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 or the other, I forget his name, the other queer African man. But the, what I'm the point I'm trying to make is that Baldwin. we can't, depend Baldwin, yes, James Baldwin. Mm -hmm. We can't depend on an analysis that's like centered on like individual figures. We have to build a politic um, that is like holistically inclusive meaning that we have to understand how queer and trans antagonism were propagated intentionally by colonizers. 
we have to understand how patriarchy had existed before colonization. For some reason, that's like a controversial statement, but it just point blank did. We have to understand how colonizers exploited existing patriarchy to colonize Africa. We have to understand that unless we work through these internal contradictions, unless revolutionary African liberation struggles, the movement to build Pan-Africanism actually means and includes all Africans, that we are just gonna get divided and conquered again. So the way that I have started to approach um, this question of like learning from gender variant, queer and trans African revolutionaries is like starting at the movement and working backwards. Um, what I mean is that like when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, for example, uh, people were like, how are we going to protect ourselves? What do we do? We've never dealt with this before. And then queer and trans people were like, we have. Because of the AIDS epidemic that happened in the 80s and early 90s that killed many, many people because of a failed US pandemic response, very similar to the one that we're working through. And so queer and trans communities, particularly African working class queer and trans communities, had to organize their own systems of protection and defense, their own systems of healthcare, because the state was not going to provide it, the state was going to let them die. So Marsha P. Johnson, for example, was part of an organization called ACT UP. I'll put the link in the chat. Um, which I really highly recommend folks learn about because it's a model of like community health. It's a model of community defense uh, that we need to learn from. We are currently living through a pandemic where we're being left to die and queer and trans African people have already done this work, have built organizations and structures and institutions that we can build upon. So yeah, I, I think that we gotta look at the movements and find them, find their politics, find their strategy and learn from it. Don't just like drop their names. All right. Um, last question. Um, first, you know, thank everybody for all the knowledge you've dropped. Um, so this one is um, is asking specifically for knowledge. Um, it's basically, it says, um, please share three book titles for a young and old lay person who just don't get it. <laughs> um, so I'm, I imagine that's like beginner text, things that can help people get into some of the things we discussed today. Um, and if y'all would feel free to share that and also like, you know, some of the reasoning behind why you think those texts should be recommended. Um, one that was very transformational for me was Asada Shakur's autobiography. Um, one, because of who she is, but two, because she just writes in like a regular way. Like she just writes like someone you know, and it's very understandable. Like she's talking about communism, she's talking about anti-colonialism, she's talking about like the day-to-day -day practice of building revolution, but she's not talking about it in a pretentious or inaccessible way. She's talking about it like a regular working class African woman. And so I feel like that book, the way she breaks down the necessity of organization, the necessity of political education, what it means to be principled is like a very, very good starting point for someone who's brand new to these politics, particularly young African women and marginalized gender folks. I recommend uh, The War Before by Safiya Bukhari. I'm currently reading this right now. Um, and I'm finding a lot of value in not just, it has a very similar sort of narrative style. I feel like for people who've read Asada's autobiography, which really was what pushed me over the edge, I would say. But one of the things that um, Sophia Bukhari really is emphasizing throughout the text is how we repair our relationships within movement work, how we navigate conflict. She has an essay um, that Hood Communist published uh, last week called um, Friends and Enemies. Uh, and I think it's like on, on, on contradictions or whatever. Um, and I feel like sort of like we have a lot of there's like a lot of things that you can read and and process about building movements and all these things but a lot of a lot of what goes wrong is that we don't know how to address things when they start to fall apart and then things fall apart and then we just like like she points out agree to disagree or we like walk away or we make enemies out of people we ice people out who had been very good comrades to us before and reading that i feel like it's the kind of reading these kinds of things i think are going to be useful for us building a movement uh into into the future because solving contradictions is and the resolving contradictions is not easy, especially if you're a person like me that's like very conflict avoidant. Um, but it's something that we all have to learn how to do sooner or later.
I mean, I guess I could give my books. <laughs> um, well, I, I want to say Revolutionary Suicide, um, particularly because it's today. Um, but also, I think it's a great um, text for people who are now getting into it, for people who are now trying to delve into the Panthers and what they were all about, but really understanding the ideology behind the Panthers that I think that is skewed um, by the sort of mainstream, um, the way that they're, they're talked about mainstream, right? Uh, I guess they're talked about in that sort of, uh, that, that armed struggle way or, you know, they're radicals or the, you know, those sort of terroristic terms that people would use. But I think when you do revolutionary suicide, you really understand not only like the genuine love for the people, but the intention behind what it means to be revolutionary, what it means to walk in that path, what it means to actually be principled and commit yourself to these sort of politics and ideologies. So I think that that as a primer um, really sort of began to change my mind about what it all means to be dedicated to the work. Um, and of course, Asada, of course, of course, of course, Asada. And then, uh, of course, Claudia Jones, I want to give a shout out to Left of Karl Marx, because that really uh, transformed my views um, about how I approached um, certain things or certain um, figures. So, yeah. Also, y'all asked, can I answer again? Um, Y'all asked about maybe African revolutionaries that folks haven't heard of. I want to say that the organization in my political home, the All African People's Revolutionary Party, is over 50 years old. Uh, it has folks that have been in the struggle for 20, 30, 40 years continuously building this organization, building the worldwide Pan-African movement. Um, and so a lot of the my like political development has been informed by cadre within the APRP. Like Ajamu is certainly one of them. And if you Google Ajamu's name, Ajamu Umi, you can find his writing, you can find the Our Ancestors Voices show. But there's also people like Umani Omoja, who is uh, APIP cadre on our central committee. Also, I believe on the central committee of the PIGC in Guinea-Bissau. And that man came from St. Louis. And now he's in Guinea-Bissau on the, the, the main organizing body of a mass revolutionary Pan-African political party. Um, and uh, Menjiba, Erwa, and Ghana, again, came from the DMV moved to Ghana to carry out party work. If you look for her name, you can find her writing. She's brilliant. John Trimble in Azania, same thing, moved from California, South Africa, still working for the party, has some of like the clearest analysis of settler colonialism that I've ever heard and clearly connects it to settler colonialism throughout the Western hemisphere and in Africa. So like, oh yeah, and Moya and Zuri uh, in, in the California chapter of the APRP as well. So like, I have learned so much um, from the elders and cadre of the APRP and I just like really just have to big up multi-generational revolutionary African organizations because the opportunity to learn from like truly principled revolutionary elders is like unmatched. It helps you like contextualize the things you're reading about because a lot of times they were there. So yeah, I'll put those names in the chat. And I just want to just give shout out and recognition to our comrade, uh, Comrade uh, Sabukwe Shakura, who I saw is in here, who organizes in our Kenya, East Africa chapter. Also read Black Agenda Report because that's 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 the mother. That's that's the mother. And RP Glenn Ford. Definitely. Um and Ray Hood Communist too. Uh, <laughs> that should be obvious after today, but uh a real hood communist um so yeah we're gonna uh we're gonna wrap it up uh i just want to thank y'all once again for coming through and just dropping bombs and um just breaking it down i i deeply appreciate it and i think everybody in the chat and everybody watching appreciated it as well um i think i need to make a few announcements and then um, we'll just we'll close out um so hold on let me you can um let me do the announcement these announcements okay. and you can do the other one okay go ahead um, all right, so on February 21st, 2022, there is an event called uh, Political Prisoners and Colonized People, the Solidarity Imperative, and that is a webinar that is co-sponsored by a coalition of several groups. 
Um, and it will look directly at key organizing challenges with updates from frontline organizers and analysis from longtime activists. Um, it will conclude with an open exchange on potential areas for future work together. And for more information about that, um, I'm going to drop it is on the BAP website, but I'm going to drop the link in the chat. Net, our next uh, webinar in the Black Power series webinars is on March 17th, 2022 at 7 p.m. Eastern. And that is called Gary 50 Years Later, Why Is the Question Still Reform or Revolution? And this is take, looking, it's a retrospective on the 1972 Gary Convention. Um, so uh, stay tuned for more information about that. Please be sure to check out the Black Alliance for Peace re, uh, resource link uh, for more information about Ukraine and what this Ukraine situation actually means for African people. It is not just about white folks. It, it <laughs> pertains very directly to um, our, our realities. So there's a link in the chat for that. Um, please consider joining Black Alliance for Peace if you are an African. And if you are not an African, please consider joining the Black Alliance for Peace uh, Solidarity Network. And of course, always donate. Finally, do read the latest piece on hood communists called The House is Burning. I'm going to drop a link in the chat for that. And, you know, read this latest piece and read hood communists in general. Um, and yeah, those are all the announcements that I have. So you can take it home to Black. I only have one announcement um, on Wednesday. Um... Yeah, on Wednesday, February 23rd of this month, um, there's a film discussion called um, Passing It On, The Black Panther's Search for Justice. Um, this is um, put on by the Pan-African Action Community. It's a, a screening of the film, um, and it chronicles the story of uh, Daruba Ben Wahad, a leader and member of uh, the New York Black Panther Party and a co-founder of the Black Liberation Army who was targeted by the FBI and wrongfully imprisoned for 19 years. Um, it says, what methods did the state use to target black revolutionaries? How can we continue the struggle to free all political prisoners? After the film, there will be a discussion with uh, Daruba Ben Wahad. And I believe, yeah, Nefta just, drunk, Nefta just dropped, dropped that link in the chat. So um, go ahead and sign up for that if you got time. Um, otherwise, we are going to get out of here. I think, I hope everybody learned something. I think um, we have to deconstruct uh, Black History Month. I think it served its purpose uh, the way, you know, it might have been constructed formally. Uh, but I think the vision that was laid out today um, helps us move beyond that. Uh, a lot of the tactics that were used when it comes to uh, representation, um, and I, I also like to make the distinction that there's a difference between trying to combat white supremacy as opposed to just seeing yourself on the screen. Um, and a lot of times, Black History Month has been moved towards the, the latter as opposed to the former. But a lot of those tactics were done with a different set of conditions, and we need to adjust ourselves to the conditions of today um, so we can, you know, fight for liberation, uh, continuing to, to, to do things that might be out are, that are outdated um, is not going to help us move forward. So uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, no compromise, no retreat. Uh, peace out.